Okay, folks, here we are. The last lesson in this AI for Science and ML Commons illustrated by deep learning for earthquakes. Here we get some results from the earthquake model and we comment on its implications for AI for Science, something we have started off the lecture with. Okay, let's go, folks. All right. So here, uh, just as a reminder, uh, the actual f in our paper we d we have actually a fourth model over here with an autoencoder and a temporal convolutional network, which was used to predict uh, extreme events. But here we're only doing these three here, which is the actual earthquake prediction itself into the future. And notice the ch different sizes recorded here: LSTM 67,000. Um, uh, less than 67,000 uh, weights. Uh, temporal fusion transformer over 8 million. Science transformer over 2.3 million. Pretty big. And a big difference between the LSTM and these uh, transformer based systems. I pointed out that uh, although LSTM is somehow much smaller, uh, it actually executes, does, the execution time does not reflect the, the, these ratios because the Transformer is uh, has these large matrix multipliers, which go like a bat out of hell on GPUs. So here we are. Now, um, now we have lots of weights, but I mean one thing to remember about uh, deep learning. I used to, when I didn't do deep learning, but did more traditional chi-squared fits. I was very sensitive to the number of parameters, which is the equivalent of the number of weights. Because I used to use Newton's method and second order model models to try to make the thing converge fast. With steepest descent, you're relatively insensitive to having too many parameters. Because if the problem is independent of a parameter, well, it never it has zero derivative, and therefore it doesn't do anything in the steepest descent. It just sits there at, at around its the same value. So steepest descent as an optimization method is quite insensitive to being having too large a model. Well, not totally, but pretty insensitive. Now what does happen is that you can do overfitting. And that leads to the training loss becoming significantly less than the validation and testing loss. And um, as far as I know, there's no exact rule as to where you stop, but uh, you don't really want the validation loss to go up and the training loss to go down drastically, I mean, which you actually see here. Here is some one of the TFT models. Here is the validation, which is so slowly increasing. And here is the training, pretty going down actually somewhat faster than the LST, the validation is going up. So uh, the combined is actually getting better and better, but it's doing that by fitting the training data uh, in a too great an extreme. Uh, this compares somewhat differently from the LSTM. The LSTM doesn't uh, uh, sort of converges. I mean, we have validation equals training at the, uh, 30, and this is more of the up around 8 to 10 here. Um, I should say this depends. Um, Somewhat on the batch size, if you decrease the batch size, then the TFT has actually a smaller batch size here than the um, LSTM did. With smaller batch size, you converge faster because you get more, more, more um, jumps into um, more changing in the parameters per epoch. Uh, so probably the number of changed is per e no total number of changed parameter sets is more important than the. Um, than the number of epochs. Um, it's also worth noticing as another side remark on computing time. If you increase the batch size, you actually decrease the computing time. That's because if you have a given epoch, if you double the batch size, you um, that's um, you halve the number of batches, and um, but the trouble is that the because of the vectorization of the GPUs, over a certain range of batch sizes, the compute time per batch is actually more or less independent of the batch size, because it's all vectorized and parallel over the batch dimension. So that says, say, if you doubled the batch size, you might uh, halve the compute time per epoch. However, 
uh, you actually converge slower, so you don't actually have the total compute time. Uh, and it's possible even that, um, so that's a, that, that it needs further study. And so the compute time for a given accuracy is a non-trivial function of, uh, of batch size. And I changed the batch size so it didn't converge too quickly. Okay, now we have a set of slides which um, give some sort of results for the predictions. The first is sort of what you might call the basic prediction, which is two weeks. You go up to a time t in two week intervals, now you predict the next two week intervals. And uh, the, um, this, they, these are just the selection of the data, of the results. Here we have the LSTM results. And uh, up here, F is 0,298, that is the full error over the entire range. The S and the E are the start, the first half of the data, and E is the end. Um, and for this uh, time interval, the end is not as good as the start, because the end probably has more richer data set. Uh, for some of the cases, you'll find the end is um, better than the start, because for transformers, you can only use data in the past, and so at the start, you can't really use the transformer uh, model. And here we have training. Training is always on the on the left train T R. And here we have V for validation. Validation is on the right. All right. These plots here are relatively similar between the different models. Um, so we have here the um, Science transformer, it actually runs on a DGX because of the large memory needed. And it has very similar results for uh, the uh, full, with again, the full being better for the training here, T, and somewhat worse for the validation V over here, 328 versus 296, 327 for the LSTM. Pretty similar. Now we have the transformer, and uh, for some reason the font size has changed. Um, it actually is actually significantly better than the previous fits, and you can sort of see that from mess from the red. The red is less in, is not as high for this than it is for the transformer. Here's the training again, and here's the validation. So the TFT, especially for training. Uh, gives better answers. For validation, it actually gives somewhat worse answers than the than the uh, LSTM and science transformer. Okay, now we come to six months. Those were two weeks. So this is sort of interesting because we're learning the six month uh, from the data up uh, two week data. So this is a little different from some other predictions. And here is the training, which is uh, for here 2068, here 2075 for validation. And you can see it's pretty much got roughly the right structure. Um, and here the, the end is better than the start. I told you you'd expect to see that. And here we have the um, even we here we have the uh, training and the validation for the science transformer running on the DGX is only the science transformer is run on the DGX. We will look at the uh, Nash Sutcliffe efficiency to get the uh, overall summary of results. Here we have the temporal fusion transformer for six months, and um, it's uh, pretty reasonable results. And you can see, especially for the training, it's particularly good. Um, for validation, it's it's uh, it is uh, not as not as good as for tra training. It overfits, so for validation, it's getting a fair answer. Now we have four years. For four years, we don't have the temporal fusion transformer because we only ran it for one year into the future. Here is the LSTM, <coughs> significantly higher uh, higher loss. It's 
still a pretty reasonable, qualitatively reasonable description, training, validation. And then here we have the D, running on the DGX, the uh, science transformer. Again, getting reasonable answers, training, validation. All right, so this is summarized in the next slide, which gives you the normalized uh, nash sutcliffe evolution. Remember, 1 is perfect, 0.5 to 0 is worst possible answer, and 0.5 is as good as predicting the mean. And you can see, of course, for the training, especially for the TFT, the TFT always has very high training value, because I said it tends to overfit in the way I run it. Maybe we should run it differently. Because you can see here, for validation, there's not nearly as much difference. Um, and um, it uh, varies a little. I mean, if you look at the LSTM and Sanchez one TFT, they sort of battle it out for um, for the validation. Sometimes one is best, and sometimes the other. But always. The answers are not too bad, 80%, 0.8 is not bad. Um, and of course, we got super good answers here. Remember how clean some of those plots are for the TFT? It does a great, it does a great fitting, because it has these 8 million parameters to determine. So this is just a very initial study, because as far as I know, none of this work has been done in the, none work quite like this has been done in the past. We're not quite certain if we should do the faults and the static variables in the same fashion. How we do these multi-horizon futures from two weeks to four years. Uh, we chose a, vari a various a particular way. Whether that's right, I don't know. The TFT has published and it does univariate. We had to modify it to do multivariate because we wanted to go to the future. Uh, there's the question of how if you do attention, whether you do space or time, that's sort of really a Possibly a, a feature of the data, whether it should be purely in time or space and time. I would have guessed space and time, but uh, I may be wrong. Um, well, there are these so-called known inputs, where we um, use the John polynomials and Fourier transforms, and Google used uh, today as a holiday and today as a weekend. So they're pretty. I find that quite interesting. The known inputs. Uh, how about the nash sutcliffe efficiency? Was that the right way to uh, look at things? Um, there was the definition of test and validation set. We used uh, spatial dis dis division, but probably time might be better. Then we have to look at the variable, log e, e to the quarter, Benioff strain, or e. Benioff strain is the square root of e. And I've already mentioned up here with static variables, faults are unclear. These are a mix of earthquake science and computer science issues. So that's good for interdisciplinary work. It's really, and it's all sort of wide open. And another good thing to do is just look at the same questions and different problems, because that will give you a hint as to the right answer. And when we're only going to do a very small number of problems, you're not going to get the right answer. Here is a summary to, uh, plot coming originally a variant from um, Department of Energy. and. Um, here we have uh, artificial intelligence, AI for science. And um, it's summarized here that we have this magic, this diagram I drew, theory date driven versus data driven. Here are some typical neural nets, autoencoder, um, multilayer perceptron. And um, here we have uh, different problem classes. Um, different types of networks or different types of machine learning. And I say, here's a key feature of deep learning. It builds flexible models, which means you need less a priori knowledge. You don't have to guess a kernel function. and But you still have a hyper-random choice, and so the, because you do have to decide the number of layers and the sizes of the layers and the architecture. And we even saw that architecture, quite a little different or architectures for the earthquake problem. So then we have this um, choices in scientific discovery. We have classic theoretical science, you think. Classic observational science, you look. 
then you take a, you try to take a theory like Newton's law and you fit the theory with very small number of parameters. When I used to do this, uh, it was less than 100. And um, because in those days, well, uh, the optimization program didn't work so well as they do now. Uh, and then you have, can do simulations, but then you need to really understand numerics, which of course is well understood now. It's really a huge amount of work over the last, um, uh, especially uh, whatever it is, 40 years. Um, parallel computing sort of started in the early 80s, so that's uh, 40 years ago. Um, then we have this choice between the data-driven science approach, which I've tried to describe, which although it's called AI for science, currently it's deep learning for science. Uh, then we pointed out that uh, right at the beginning, the surrogates where you actually uh, train deep learning to replace the simulation are very interesting. That I only described you that for a simple 16 particle um, molecular dynamics case, but they can be used in much broader uh, broadly. And I showed how that could allow you to think of deep learning as sort of being the new Newton's laws of life. And then we have here all these other issues I've already given on the previous slide. And here we have the poor old theory-driven model with this RIP over it, because we're going to replace it by data-driven. Or are we? Who knows? That's You will find out as we move on into the future. And over the next five to ten years, there will be a revolution in science. What the result is, I don't know, but there will be a revolution. And here is sort of a, some maybe sad remarks from the past. This is what I did when I built a model in 1978 to 79 with my colleagues, a Nobel Prize winner, Richard Feynman, and Rick Field, who uh, went on to a great uh, career as a faculty member at the University of Florida. And here we published our paper in November 1978. <laughs> And we were comparing this data here, these error bars, with our various models to show that um, partons existed, and quarks existed, and gluons existed. Now there, the model didn't come from deep learning, it came from Feynman, sort of. He had a brilliant intuition as to what uh, um, quarks and gluons would do when they were produced in a high, trend, in a high energy experiment. This particular experiment, actually, I, I was part of the experimental team. No, not this one, the next one I did was. This one here is um, um, the, ex ex experiment, the experiments are observed, and we're trying to show that this data on single particle, single pions produced, and just look at the single pion. And what's uh, critical of the data is it, it doesn't continue to fall off, it levels off. And the leveling off is due to the quarks and gluons. So there we are. And this leveling off gets up more as you go to higher and higher energies. Okay, and our model roughly reproduces this dependence. And other people's models did not do as well as ours. We had very good models in those days. If you have a Nobel Prize winner on your team, you can get a good model. And here is my favorite picture of Feynman. And uh, we did the similar types of model fits to us. Uh, these I was part of the experiment. Uh, in fact, this was E260, large transverse momentum. Uh, so a similar experiment to the previous one, but this one we were actually, I was part of the Caltech experimental team that derived this data. Here's another Caltech experimental team I was part of, E350. Later number, these are Fermi lab numbers of experiments. And this was so called looking at Reggie theory. With again, this leveling off. Leveling off was always characteristic of. In uh, uh, elementary particles lying inside the, uh, inside the, in this case, the protons and the pions and things which were involved. And uh, these results still actually haven't been ex properly explained, but uh, they were, uh, I consider this, this was uh, quite nice work in my opinion. And these, so we did three experiments on to try to look at um, <coughs> this type of work at uh, Fermilab. But I will, what I want to stress is the, what the models were. The models were based on theory, not on bunches of neurons. And they, they had parameters. In this case here was the parameters to define the so-called trajectories of these um, 
uh, of these part of the so-called exchange ready particles. In the case here, the parameters were the, um, the parameters describing the, the uh, uh, fragmentation of gluons and squarks into pions and other particles, mainly pions. <coughs> So that's my last slide. This is the change in models. We've gone from sophisticated physics-based models to more general parameterized models. And that's why I say deep, <coughs> it's not to say that physics models aren't still good, because they teach you about physics. But it, you can now look at these things with these uh, deep learning, because deep learning can parameterize what's going on. So that's uh, the end of this uh, particular